two and a half to six X the click-through rate, generating post engagement from employees with low follower counts and turning internal SMEs into actual thought leaders. Hey, let's face it, you may call them thought leaders, but if no one is hearing, let alone following their thoughts yet, then maybe we shouldn't call them thought leaders, right? Anyway, these are all results we talk about in today's episode with Brittany Blanken at Metadata and Tim Davidson at Directive as we talk about a brand new feature rolling out on LinkedIn in the next few weeks, LinkedIn Thought Leader Ads. They combine the targeting and control of LinkedIn paid ads with the authenticity, engagement, and effectiveness of organic posts from individuals on your team. Brittany breaks down the results of their 60 days of testing this new feature in the LinkedIn ads beta program. And if you stick around until the end, she, Tim, and I had an unlock on how to use this as a potential cheat code for leveraging the advisors and content creators your brand partners with as well. Welcome back to Marketing Together. I'm Logan Lyles, Head of Partnerships at Teamwork. I'm joined today by Brittany Blanken with Metadata, Tim Davidson with Directive. This is a first on Marketing Together. We've got multiple guests on the same episode, and we're going to be talking about a way that you can market with the theme of this show, right? Not just marketing to, but marketing with your internal employees who maybe fancy themselves content creators, maybe they are content creators, or maybe they're just willing to share content. Brittany, this episode was really prompted by something I saw you post on LinkedIn just this week on LinkedIn thought leadership ads. Tell us a little bit, what the heck are LinkedIn thought leadership ads? And then we'll get into why you guys are both excited about this, how you've tested it as metadata has been in the beta program and what you guys think uh, folks are going to be able to leverage uh, out of this. It's early, but tell us, give us some context. What the heck is a LinkedIn thought leadership ad? Yeah, great question, Logan. It's great to be here. I mean, at the end of the day, LinkedIn thought leader ads are, is, is going to be a new ad type that will allow marketers to sponsor employee content directly from your company's page through the campaign manager. We're about to be able to sponsor internal thought leaders, and the game is about to be changed. Does it have to be a new post? Does it have to be video? Does it have to be graphics? Like, um, because you guys at Metadata have been in the beta program, what are some of the rules of the road or is it pretty wide open right now, Brittany? Right now, the beta program was pretty wide open. The biggest thing was we had to select um, a few of our internal thought leaders. But once this goes like GA, like they call it, and when they go live, you'll be able to really sponsor anyone that's an employee. And it could be something as simple as a video, as something as plain text, text with images. So um, in the beta, we weren't actually allowed to or able to test anything with a video, but we were able to test posts that had um, images versus only text. And there was some really interesting insights that I gathered from just the short 60-day test cycle from that. But overall, it seems like the it's going to be a wide open playing field for a lot of marketers. We're going to get into some specific metrics, your hypothesis, um, some learnings, and you've got some data to share with us from uh, your LinkedIn post that you talked about in your 60 days uh, in the beta program. Tim, you're one I wanted to have you on for this conversation because I've literally had conversations with other marketers about, hey, if you looked at ads from Directive, oftentimes they look like Tim's organic posts. And that's been something that you guys have strategically done. It seems like you guys, you in particular and the team at Directive have already been thinking about like, how do we merge paid ads with organic style content? Would you say that's kind of why you're excited about this opportunity? Because it seems like you guys were already headed in this direction or am I misreading it there? No, you're you're definitely right. We did not have beta access, and that was my fault. I missed the email, um, but so I'm a little disappointed there. But we, uh, yeah, we try to do that right now. But there, it's like an extra step, right? You have to post it under the logo of the company, and you don't get all the built-in uh, engagement that already came from the social post that was already you already had, right? And now, Brittany, correct me if I'm wrong, but like when you boost those, it comes with the engagement that that was already there. Yeah. That extra is just like a psychological, like, oh, this is this is gonna be a great post it's coming from a person, and it's already got you know however many shares and, and comments and all those things. So you can really jump in the comments as well. Um, but yeah, you know, the most biggest reason I'm excited, and this is why I'm trying to go down this route, is people 
buy from people. It's, I mean, I've done tests like this where it's like the person's face versus the logo. Unless you're like specific, very specific companies, for the most part, the person always wins. That's why influencer marketing wins. That's it's why all those type of things always win. So to be able to do this, tying it with the person, the face, and the engagement that's already built in, it's really, really exciting. Um, I'm like, I'm, I'm overexcited because I'm just going to use it constantly. Yeah. And just to kind of jump in too, I mean, not only humanizing your brand, but you can, this is going to give the ability for marketers to sponsor content that is going to resonate with your target ICPs, right? So for metadata, we're talking to B2B marketers. Why not put me and Jason and Mark front and center to talk to people just like us? So it's leaning into humanizing, you know, your internal thought leaders, number one. But number two, the less an ad looks like an ad, the better. Yeah. And I think, you know, Tim, in the way that you guys have kind of headed down this road proves exactly what Brittany has said. Like you've run tests, right? The things that don't look like ads, the things that highlight people that have faces, they perform better. It's just like, you know, not a lot of B2B marketers really know YouTube all that well. Uh, if you are in that boat, go back after you listen to me, Tim and Brittany today, Gaetano Denardi did a fire episode on how to actually dive into YouTube and B2B uh, a few episodes back on the show. But that aside, one of the things I've always heard about thumbnails on YouTube is what works really well. Big faces, the bigger the eyes, um, it's just playing on psychology, right? Like we connect with people um, and not playing on it in a manipulative way. Like this is one of the things like when I read Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, who's a former FBI hostage negotiator, and that book kind of made its rounds through B2B salespeople. It was like, well, I'm learning these like hostage negotiating tri tri uh, tips and applying them to sales. Is this manipulative? And he actually calls that out in the book and was like, no, you're just understanding how humans communicate, how people respond in conversation and to content, and you're leaning into that. So you're not fighting an uphill battle. And so I think this plays exactly into that. And the other thing that struck me as you were talking about, I want to get both of y'all's thoughts on, I've talked to folks, marketing leaders who say, yes, we have these thought leaders internally. I'm like, well, one, you have subject matter experts, not thought leaders, because no one's hearing or following their thoughts yet. So let's clarify that. But if you're trying to turn your SMEs into thought leaders, oftentimes they have great content, but getting them super active on LinkedIn, building their following, like that takes a lot. You've got to have someone who has the content, who also has the personality to create that content, the commitment to it. And sometimes that's tough, right? This also, I think, solves that challenge for a lot of marketers who look internally and they say, I have these SMEs who could be thought leaders um, if I could create more content with them because now we can push it out and it's not the company logo, it's their profile photo. If it does get some organic engagement, um, you know, then it comes with the post, as you guys said earlier. Like, is that something you guys have seen other marketing teams are like, hoping to find a way to do and they've run into some of the struggles or am I alone in kind of thinking that of like SME to thought leader path that a lot of marketers are trying to um, trying to go down with their internal folks? I mean, I don't think you're off base, Logan. I really think at the end of the day, it depends on the audience you're trying to go after. If you're a marketer and your audience is on LinkedIn, for instance, then yeah, let's double down on LinkedIn. Um, especially now more than ever when budgets are contracting and you're trying to do less with more or more with less. There we go. Um, what we were trying to do at Metadata was how could we amplify our organic content through strategically aligning all of our marketers um, with like content themes for each month. So we would get on a call and strategize, hey guys, um, it started becoming a part of like my daily motion or weekly motion to post on LinkedIn because we knew we were strategic, strategically get, uh, getting in front of the right audience on LinkedIn. But say, you're, say the target audience isn't on LinkedIn, right? Maybe they're on Facebook. I think this is going to open up avenues and prove that um, content um, is going to be content from your internal SMEs are going to be more important. And there's now avenues to sponsor that even with that. It's going to cause even more greater impact. Well said, Tim, what would you add to that? I'm, I'm going out of a couple of avenues here because I, I do think on one hand, right. There's me, right. When I 
I can put out an organic post and, you know, a lot will fail, but there's also some that do pretty well and then I'll get like that traction and I'll be like, oh, this kind of really gets addicting. You try to create more and more and more. For a lot of people on my team, they don't have that traction yet. So maybe it's harder to keep going, even though they are subject matter experts. So actually with these sponsored posts, I'm, I've been even just in this conversation thinking like, all right, if they can actually put out a post that has the, the information that we want, that, that we need, that's really valuable to our buyers. But if you put it out organically, you really don't have control over who you're getting in front of. So with the sponsored posts, and I know Brittany's going to talk about the data, so it's pretty good cost so far. Uh, you can actually test those kind of hypotheses in front of the right people. The other side of this equation is people that as marketers were like, oh, I wish I could get more content from our CEO. I wish this SME internally, like, and we've got to coach them on when to post, how to post, you know, uh, what happens when they post and it's just crickets. Oh, never mind. Brittany's been trying to rope me into doing these interviews and posting on LinkedIn. And look, I finally did it and nothing came of it. You touched on something there, Tim, I hadn't even thought about, like the emotion of your internal content creators, SMEs, thought leaders, whatever we're calling them, your internal employees that you want to create content with and from, you can actually maybe build some traction because you've now got a new tool to kind of deposit some more in their emotional bank account if their first posts don't just get crickets, right? Right. And two, these thought leader ads, they level the playing field regardless of how much organic reach you have. I know we're going to get into the data later, or maybe we go into it now. That's what's fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect segue, Brittany. So, I mean, your post had a ton of metrics in it. Tell us a little bit about some of the highlights from the post for folks that didn't see it yet. Yeah, for sure. Well, the biggest one, uh, just going back to organic versus sponsored content, right? I specifically um, tested three marketers on the metadata marketing team, me, uh, Jason Woodup, and then Mark Huber. Um, a lot of marketers may know who Jason Woodup or Mark Huber are. You might not know who, I, who the hell I am, but that's okay. And the, one of the biggest things why I selected myself is because I do have a lower follower count than the leading indicator to the thought leader success was not dependent on how many followers one had. So for instance, Jason has 11,000 followers, I have 4,000, but our thought leader ads had similar results. So again, going back, it's leveling the playing field. So if you do have an internal SME that's really producing a lot of content, but they're not getting a ton of organic traction, this could be a viable next step to boost their, um, boost their content um, to really create more brand trust with the people you're trying to get in front of. That's really interesting. I think that uh, aligns with our hypothesis there that you have a way to take the folks internally who maybe haven't been super active on LinkedIn, but have the content to be able to share. And now you can overcome that typical barrier. Tell us a little bit about the click-through rate comparison overall. Because like we said, you guys ran about 60 days uh, testing in the beta how did these thought leader ads compare to your typical performance with LinkedIn ads? That, Logan, was the game changer. That's why I posted on LinkedIn and I'm so excited about it. Our uh, click-through rates that we received were two and a half times more than our average CTR. Um, so to break it down, like that's insane. And if you break it down even further based off of like Mine and Jason's was about two and a half more. Mark's was our top performer experiment. It actually received 6% higher, 6X, not 6%, sorry, 6X times higher CTR than we've, what we've seen. And you're like, okay, Brittany, CTR, big whoop, right? I think if you take a step back in this whole approach that I took was here at Metadata, we are trying to create brand trust and brand awareness and to help B2B marketers with their daily jobs. And Metadata could help you do that if you have um, if you're running paid ads, right? And so the whole idea with my approach and why CTR matters within my strategy was, okay, how can we get in front of the right people? And then how can we get them to engage with these brand awareness ads to then allow us to retarget them with maybe something different later? Again, serving up more relevant content depending on what they're engaging with. So going back to CTR, like a lot of marketers know, you can create retargeting audiences based off of 
who's engaging with your ad, who's clicking your ad, who's commenting on your ad. And then that's just going to fuel your strategy, your bottom of the funnel strategy even farther, right? So that's why the CTR and seeing such a crazy like result is fascinating. And it's going to allow me to maybe place my bets on something like this and my brain awareness plays to then maximize my budgets later. That's a really good point in the CTR, two and a half X, six X, those are really exciting. And that's enough reason to, you know, to pursue this strategy, but not that alone. Like it can impact the rest of your LinkedIn strategy. It can impact your bottom of funnel content because you're seeing what's resonating because you have a little bit more control over it there. Uh, Tim, I mean, you break down a lot of stuff in, you know, looking at what works, what doesn't. When you hear two and a half X, six X, like put that as put that into some context for us um, in all the the ads that that you see, uh, the campaigns that you see running that you guys are involved with with Directive. Like put that into some context for us. What do you think when you hear two and a half, six X? It's uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, I actually just recently ran one to one AVM campaigns, so it was just like, hey, logo, and those had really high click rates, like six, not six X. I mean, that's, it's crazy. Um, so like, and that's speaking specifically to a logo, right? It's the actual company. Uh, that's the, you can increase those click rates. I know everyone's like, oh, you know, you, you don't need click through rate, blah, blah, blah. It's been two months. Let, let it ride. Uh, you know, you're testing it for two two months. Uh, but also as you were saying all that stuff, I'm just thinking about like the flywheel effect here. Cause if you think about it, you can essentially shape. So if you have a subject manager expert at your company, Say it's the CEO, CMO, it doesn't matter. You can now shape your followers. Because instead of like the organic reach where you have no really say who's going to see it, yeah, you can kind of play the game a little bit there. But if you boost it to the right people, if you sponsor it to the right, uh, to your buyers, you'll end up getting, the, with that click-through rate, you'll end up getting followers from those, which meaning those type of people that you want to talk to will see your organic post more. And it's kind of, you keep running with that and then you're just going to boost both sides of it. And then you're going to start seeing what works, what doesn't it's. It's like a completely cheat code, to be honest. That's just such a good point because one of the big things that I was tracking was, you know, where did we baseline? How many likes did we get? Where do we start with like some of the likes, right? Or, and how many followers did we have? And like overall, like it increased my follower count, um, by, well, it increased my post like account by 24%. And I got several followers out of it. So I want to say several, I didn't really track how many followers I wish I did. But just anecdotally speaking, I had to have gained at least 50 new followers just by boosting that ad for 60 days. So that's just a compounding effect right there too. So Brittany, you guys tested a few different uh, people within the team, Mark, Jason, and yourself. There was some variation to the ads themselves. What are your hypotheses around video versus image versus text only? Um, we already determined, at least from this test, like follower count doesn't seem to have a big impact on the performance. Um, what are some of your thoughts in both what you've seen and kind of looking forward on what you want to test? What are some of your hypotheses around the different uh, content types? Yeah, so when I was testing, I tested um, three different types of ads. So all these ads were posted within the, really the last 30 to 45 days, um, of my test. So they were still really relevant. So that was really key there. Um, but the big difference between all the ads was the content itself. So Mark was actually the only one that I sponsored that didn't have a photo. I had a photo, like an image in my post and so did Jason. And what I found was Mark's post had a higher engagement rate and click through rate, like significantly more than mine and Jason's. My hypothesis there, maybe that photo, uh, like not having a photo, maybe it appeared more organic. Maybe it appeared a little bit more authentic. I also looked at how the image, um, how the content kind of looked in the ad and Mark's awesome. He uses really punchy language. And even just looking at the way uh, his content kind of set on the eyes, it was really easy to consume. So that could have been an, a, a really a, a factor there. Whereas mine, 
it not only had a, a photo, but it was really long. It got into data because I was really trying to speak to the doers, right? Doers behind paid advertising. So there was a lot of stats. There's a lot of bullets. But if you look at my posts, it could be overwhelming. I mean, I candidly could be overwhelming. So it makes sense why maybe the engagement wasn't as great. So I wish I was able to um, test video. Video does amazing organically. I definitely think you can compound that uh, with um, additional thought leader ads. But you know what actually right now is doing really well, better than video organically? These carousel ads or carousel, like um, these carousel posts. So my next test would actually be designing an organic carousel post and sponsoring that through a thought leader ad and seeing how does that compare to a no image ad versus a video ad. Yeah. And t to be clear here, because I've still got a little bit of frustration here, I don't technically personally have the actual quote unquote carousel capabilities on LinkedIn, but a lot of us who have been on LinkedIn for a long time talk about the PDF uh, where you post it as a document and it is a, a carousel that you swipe through, uh, aka slide deck. So are you talking about uploading as a document and having kind of that swipe through or the carousel where you can have mixed media that isn't rolled out to everybody yet, Brittany? Mm, maybe honestly both. I think we're just so new into this. Like why not test both? But what I was referring to is uploading the document ad. So it's like it it appears as like a, a swipeable file, if you will. Yep, exactly. Tim, any thoughts there, man, uh, as Brittany was talking about with some of the different content types, what was kind of coming to mind as Brittany was talking there? Yeah, I really, I really hope to do a video, but it's also making me think about like even just creating organic posts for the boosted part of for the sponsorship, right? Like, so, you know, because of organic, you, you almost want to not speak directly to like, let's just say, I don't know, B2B marketers that are only MarTech or something like that. You like you want to speak to B2B marketers, right? In theory, though, you could actually start creating more posts that are more specific to MarTech marketers or agencies or, you know, different sizes of companies or funding people that have funding. And then you could use that as the proxy to sponsor, even though you're going to get lower engagement organically. But if you use it to sponsor to the right people, because you then you, you put it to the list of MarTech vendors or you put it to the list of agencies there's a lot you could do that and it'd be really interesting because it is again coming from a person Brittany what is uh what are next steps do you know timing of when this is going to be released it's still in beta we're uh as the as of the time of this recording but this episode will drop probably a week after that um so we'll be looking at like third week of May um what do you know right now that marketers should be thinking about um, in terms of the the logistics, things to look out for, where they can find out more information uh, about this new feature rolling out. Yeah, I've, I'm hearing it's going to drop in June. So marketers should put that on their calendar. I don't know what day in June, but keep a lookout. Uh, LinkedIn does a really good job of um, letting, like having pop-ups and letting you know through your the reps, like, hey, this is coming. Uh, the biggest thing to look out for is when you're in your the campaign manager, um, and when you go to create a, a normal, like, sponsored content um, ad, you're going to see something new um, in that campaign manager that says sponsor an employee uh, ad. That's going to be your go time of, all right, I'm ready for it. And all you need is your whoever you want to sponsor. That, that content needs to already be live. You just need to copy that URL of their LinkedIn post. And then you paste it in, and then the campaign manager will take you through steps to get it into the correct format. And then, um, and then it will be you'll be able to like go live with it. And the employee just needs to accept. Yep, I'm I'm accepting that you are sponsoring my post. And then once that's done, I like that they built that in. That sounds like a good uh, check and balance, huh? Yeah, I, I like that too. And so once they accept it, then you're good to go. So there's probably other things that they're ironing out, but that is from a high level perspective of, you know, what you need to be aware of. And I'm sure there's going to be loads of content that LinkedIn is going to promote uh, with step-by-step -step guides. Um, and you might even see metadata's um, ads because we will be featured as best-in-class ads just to give you guys some ideas of what you could or should do with your 
um, new thought leader ads. I know Brittany said earlier you can level the playing field, and I, I agree. But I also think there's going to be some people that are just going to like if some of these creators that get like ton of engagement on organically anyway, if they don't use it, and I don't, I don't think all of them will be. They're going to lose because they're going to be winning still, but they're going to lose to the ones that are on their heels because this is going to be a huge opportunity for those creators. It, it's really interesting to, I like, I, this was probably like a year, year and a half ago. Um, I saw Scott Barker uh, post basically like, when are we going to see, it might be in the near future where you're in a job interview and they're asking you about your resume and then they're asking you about your LinkedIn follower account. And I was like, that's interesting. I don't know if that'll happen in every department, if that will happen soon, but like I could see that conversation happening or at least maybe from the candidate side saying, hey, look, let me let me kind of, um, you know, make the case here. Look at my follower account. Look at what I'm doing um, just in my own content creation efforts that I think could add value. Obviously, if they're in the marketing team, that's probably more likely a conversation. But um, the last couple of questions I want to ask you guys. Um Oh, one other thought. Uh, in previous episodes, we talked with Nick Bennett at Airmeet, and we talked with Arthur Castillo at Chili Piper about working uh, as a brand with external content creators and external influencers. Could be interesting to see if this evolves to where it's not just employees, but it's anybody that you might be partnering with. Yeah, like let. I'm not trying to hate, but there's a lot of advisors going on right now where they put, "Hey, I'm advising for X company." not hating, but I guarantee you that's going to be a cheat code for people, uh, for marketers to use their advisors as employees immediately out the gate for some of these thought leaders. I, I agree. And I, 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 I agree. Some people have thoughts on it. I think it's gold mine. If you do do that that way, even if you don't do the advisor role, I bet you people, cause you think about it, like customers, you could essentially just have them Unless LinkedIn lets you use like customers, they have, to keep, they have to be working at your company. You can just create, hey, customer of uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's like the title. And then you could, if they post about it, I mean, think about how much more social proof that is just coming from a person in the feed. It's huge. Well, you guys touched on it earlier. Like I literally scratched out. I forget when you were talking about, it. I think we were like knee deep in the data as you were talking, Brittany, and you mentioned trust, that that is one of the things that you guys are trying to optimize for as the marketing team at Metadata. And one of the things we keep saying here at Partner Hacker, um, Jared Fuller has been talking about it, that data was the new oil, right? But trust is the new data, right? Because data is now cheap. Uh, it, uh, it, we still, we can all get our hands on it, but it doesn't fuel the same results, right? We're, we're putting that into the vehicles, but it's not, you know, it's not getting us as far. Um, trust is really where you're able to accelerate the things that you're trying to accomplish as a marketing team. And so I just, I wanted to bring it full circle back to that, uh, because what you said there, Tim, just made me think of that, whether it's an advisor it's a customer who is already an, ad, an advocate. Maybe they're already leveraging your referral program or your affiliate program, or you have these other influencers, or maybe you have like an agency or solution partner program. Some of the folks listening to this might be, you know, more in the partner organization. Hey, you could uh, have your partners, if it needs to be an employee, list themselves, right? Like at Teamwork, we've got a solution partner program. They could list themselves as an employee potentially, a solution partner at teamwork.com. And now I've got the opportunity to uh, to promote their post because I'm reaching out into the market, whether it's customers, advisors, um, or partners, and they've got the trust, they've got the attention of the audience that we're trying to reach. Um, and what we've been talking about at Partner Hacker, this near bound motion is really reaching into the market that you're trying to reach, finding the people that your buyers trust and really surrounding them. And so I think this conversation, even though we're going kind of uh, technical today, talking about um, paid ads um, and we're talking about LinkedIn ads, it all comes in line with this uh, idea of marketing with the folks that have the trust of your buyers um, and reaching them effectively. I love the idea of trust. I want to lean in even more. I think, it, of course, building trust is the name of the game, but we're still in an attention economy, right? So taking this one step further, 
you could even amplify someone like an entertainer. Let's take the corporate bros of the world or the corporate Natalies of the world. You can then create entertaining content that will resonate with your audience to capture attention. And of course they have the trust, but I think it, I think the attention almost surpasses trust in some ways, depending on the strategy and the approach that you want to align with the audience that you're trying to go after too. So that's another way that you could use these thought leader ads, not only to build trust, but maybe to just capture attention and be entertaining too. I think it's two sides to the same coin, at least in what you're talking about there, Brittany, because those content creators, they have the attention because they've gained the trust, because they're putting out content that is relatable. Not all of their content is trying to drive you to something like Tim's a great example of that. Like his videos cutting fruit or doing skits about like life as a B2B marketer and, and just adding commentary on things like everything is not, Hey, end of the video, like go check out directive. Um, he's built enough trust as a content creator to gain that attention. So I think it's, you make a really good point and I think it reinforces that like the trust is actually a key component in garnering that attention. Even if you can do everything else, as long as you could just put the person face as the logo instead of the, the company, that's going to make a huge difference that, that makes much more of a difference than anyone can think of. Obviously the content has to be decent, but that's, uh, it's so crazy how much more people just relate to people. So it's just much better to have it coming from a person rather than the company. And this is why it's a big part of why it's so exciting. I love it. You guys, well, thank you so much for both of you making time for the conversation today, for doing our first duo episode here on marketing together. So, uh, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, if you're listening to this, make sure that you are following uh, Brittany Blanken. You can find her last name is B-L-A-N-K-E-N. -E last time we talked, she had a different last name. It was great to catch up with you, Brittany, and uh, Tim Davidson at Directive. Give both of these folks a follow, uh, and maybe you'll see some of their content promoted. If not, but where wherever you see it, go and follow them because they'll be sharing great content. Maybe we'll have you guys on in another quarter or so after you have tested this um, more and maybe we can do an update, but I really love what you guys have shared today. Um, and some practical advice about this exciting opportunity. And this really fits in with the theme of this show, uh, in marketing with, in this case, fill in the blank is employees. Maybe those advisors too, that, that might've been the hottest tip out of this entire thing there, Brittany. Uh, marketing with your employers, not just marketing to the market. Um, because as we always say on the show, we go further faster when we're marketing together. 